There are four major threats to the global order. Pandemics, weapons of mass destruction, climate change, and as in today's case, another threat barreling towards us, cyber threats. In the heart of Bangladesh, a digital heist unfolded with meticulous precision. Hackers, armed with sophisticated malware, infiltrated the central bank's network, orchestrating a daring scheme that shook the global financial system. With careful planning and stealth, they executed a series of fraudulent wire transfers. But how much money, if any, would they get away with without ever even stepping foot inside a bank? Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, a true crime podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously and gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. A total of 35 requests for wire transfers were dispatched by the Bangladesh Central Bank on February 4th, 2016, over the international financial network known as SWIFT. The requests, which amounted to approximately $1 billion, were made with the intention of transferring cash from Bangladesh Central Bank's assets at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to 35 accounts located all over the world. Among these accounts were four accounts located in Manila and one account located in Sri Lanka. There was only one problem with those wire transfer requests. Bangladesh Central Bank didn't make them. But that's not the beginning of our story. Like bank robbers, the likes of the brewing bank robbers or Gerald Blanchard before them, this heist required years of prep work. Unlike those former capers and cocktails featured criminals, the choice of who to steal from and how would shoot this crime far into the 21st century. Best to do this over the internet, right? A traditional bank robbery can only yield so much, but targeting something as large as a country's central bank could maybe get you millions upon millions upon millions. But how? the Bangladesh Central Bank. Bangladesh in the mid-2010s had a growing economy but a weaker communications infrastructure and way, 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 way less security personnel managing their online systems. The hackers decided that Bangladesh would make the ideal target, and so they started their operations by sending out sophisticated malware embedded into a PDF file of a fake resume from a fake person named Rasal Alam. They emailed the resume to several Bangladesh Central Bank employees, and three of those employees fell for the phishing scheme, downloading the attachment. The PDF downloaded with Rasal's resume, but attached to the PDF was malware, which immediately and automatically installed malicious code onto the employee's computers, which gave the hackers full control of the computer, as if they were the employees themselves. The hackers were able to monitor the day-to-day things those employees did on those computers. They used the information to figure out which Bangladesh Central Bank employees had higher clearances to do more secure tasks, like approving wire transfers. They were also able to uncover who had access to the SWIFT terminal. SWIFT stands for the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, SWIFT. It's a messaging network used by financial institutions worldwide to securely transmit instructions and information for financial transactions. SWIFT has a massive network, over 11,000 financial institutions in more than 200 countries. Banks rely on SWIFT to transfer money around the world, Once banks join SWIFT, they can reliably transfer money electronically. But as you can imagine, access to SWIFT is really heavily limited. The people within banks that have access to SWIFT have secure credentials and a really high security clearance. Thanks to their PDF malware, the hackers for months did online reconnaissance on the Bangladesh Central Bank, and they managed to snag the SWIFT credentials they needed. Then they started monitoring how the bank made transfers and which accounts had the most money in them. They determined that several small transfers would arouse less suspicion and were less scrutinized. And they figured out that the bank had $1 billion kept in reserve in their account at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. 
But one big wrinkle in the plan was discovered when they learned that whenever the Bangladesh Central Bank made a transfer request, the network automatically sent a copy of the request to a printer that would physically print a ledger daily. It was an audit trace. One of the managers would then review the transaction in person and decline it if things seemed suspicious. If they didn't do anything, then the bank where the money was being held would perform their own review of the request and then perform the transfer into the client's account. To get around this manual review at the Bangladesh Central Bank, the hackers created another piece of malware that caused the Swift printer to print only blank pages before deleting the print history. If you're feeling confused about how exactly all this works, well, it's because it's confusing. Otherwise, we'd all be billionaires. If you're watching on YouTube, I've uploaded an infographic with how these hackers did these hacks, but to be honest, I, <laughs> I actually think it might be more confusing. According to a joint statement from several U.S. government agencies, hackers, quote, use a variety of tools and techniques to gain access to a financial institution's network, learning the topology to discover key systems and monetizing their access, end quote. Basically, they're smart and they rely on people opening suspicious emails and downloading random PDFs. Let that be a lesson to you, people. The hackers created bank accounts around the world, and feeling pretty confident that they were ready to be successful with the heist, they chose the date for the event very carefully. Thursday, February 4th, 2016, just after the Bangladesh Central Bank closed. It was an expertly chosen date for the following reasons. One, Bangladesh observes weekends on Friday and Saturday because its national religion is Islam, so almost no one would even be in to see the request until Sunday. But two, the New York-based bank that received the request would be closed for the weekend on Sunday. And three, the weekend coincided with the Lunar New Year, meaning banks across Asia would be closed on Monday, including in, very importantly, the Philippines. This gave the hackers five days where the banks would not be reliably communicating with each other. So on the evening of February 4th, they sent 35 wire transfer requests, which were flagged and rejected by the bank in New York immediately at first, because there was a formatting error. But the hackers quickly reformatted 34 of those requests and resent them. And while most of those were held for approval, five of the requests went through. On a side note, if the hackers had stayed in the SWIFT system for just one more hour, they would have been able to approve those other 30 requests, but they'd already deleted all of the records of the transactions and pieced out of the system. But... Overall, $101 million were sent to four accounts at RBCB banks in the Philippines and one account in Sri Lanka. The accounts had actually been opened in 2015 by someone on the ground, sitting with a $500 deposit in each. The Sri Lanka request would be almost immediately refunded because bankers at a German intermediary bank noticed a typo. The hackers misspelled the word foundation. And that made the $20 million transaction suspicious. That left $81 million in those Filipino accounts. When the skeleton crew arrived on Friday, February 5th to the Bangladesh Central Bank, the printer had not printed the ledger of wire transfer requests. In fact, maybe the hackers had taken it a bit too far because the printer was just actually shut down and no one there could get it started again. The next morning, they managed to get the printer up and running and it started printing out requests. Actually, it did print those ones from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to the tune of $951 million. The Bangladesh Central Bank employees immediately started panic calling the New York-based bank, which was, well, closed, and they got an answering machine. Then they tried to call SWIFT, which at the time didn't even have a 24-7 hotline because they had never experienced any kind of hack. They finally got a hold of someone who told them just to shut everything down. After that, the crew called up the chain. The top of the chain told them it was probably a mistake and not to shut anything down. They sent panicked messages also to that bank in the Philippines. But as I said before, the RBCB was closed for the Lunar New Year. Pretty quickly, the money was just pulled straight out of the bank accounts in the Philippines. It was loaded up in bank boxes into a Lexus by the bank manager of the Manila Bank branch where the accounts were. It was over a million physical bills. The manager headed to the casino closest to the airport, where a group of Chinese nationals who had just flown in made a request to gamble in junket rooms, which are traditionally designed for the highest rollers. Why a casino? It's the only industry in the Philippines that's cash only, no names, and no records. The casino industry is not regulated there at all. 
Once you've stolen such a large amount of cash, you've got to move that money into a form that you can't get caught with. And the casinos in the Philippines are the perfect place to launder money. And that amount of money was pretty common in those casinos. They wouldn't have aroused one single suspicion. The men used the stolen money to play Baccarat all day long. Then they traded their chips for clean cash that could no longer be linked to the theft. And then they vanished. In honor of the ties of this case to the Philippines, our drink today features a fruit found in the Philippines and, well, Bangladesh for that matter, that I really don't personally like very much. Please don't kill me. But I wanted to give it a chance in a frozen, delicious tropical drink that I imagine you could enjoy there, maybe even with your stolen millions in a casino. You'll start by putting two parts rum, a quarter part lime juice, one part orange liqueur, and one frozen mango into a blender. I actually just bought frozen mango chunks because we're all about working smarter, not harder here on Capers and Cocktails. Blend all of that together until it's smooth and pour into a cold glass. For the mocktail, just replace the rum with rum syrup and the orange liqueur with orange juice. You might also need to add some water to thin out the drink a little bit. That rum syrup is pretty thick. But blend it all up regardless and sip up, feeling like a smooth criminal that never left your house to become a millionaire. This crime was at a completely different scale of cybercrime than crimes in the past. Conducting a cyber attack to steal that much money was of a magnitude that no one had ever really seen before. For obvious reasons, cybercrime, especially impacting financial institutions, is actually relatively new. It wasn't until the late 1990s and early 2000s that online banking really even became a thing and accessible to the general public. When hackers realized they could steal online banking credentials and credit card numbers, they began to steal money, hundreds of dollars at a time, from individuals' bank accounts. But it wasn't long before they realized that going after the banks directly was far more lucrative. They could steal entire databases of credit card numbers and sell those on the black market. Because the internet wasn't actually designed to be the backbone of society, it wasn't really designed with strong security infrastructure. 30 years ago, most banks weren't even offering online banking, and now it's really the backbone of global finance like as a whole. There are a lot of holes if you're smart enough and, well, if you're backed by an entire government. Obviously, investigations started immediately, or I guess when the banks were all open at the same time. It was pretty obvious early on that this was way too sophisticated of a crime to involve a traditional group of hackers. This was likely the work of the actual government of North Korea. North Korea allegedly runs the Lazarus Group through their Reconnaissance General Bureau, the Lazarus Group is a notorious cybercrime syndicate known for its sophisticated and wide-ranging attacks. Operating with a high degree of anonymity, they have been linked to several high-profile incidents, including the 2014 Sony Pictures hack. And specifically, investigators believed that the hackers in this case were a branch of the Lazarus Group known as the Beagle Boys. Beagle Boys, one word with a Z. Yeah. Yeah. The Beagle Boys have been active since at least 2014, stealing hundreds of millions from banks to fund North Korea's regime. According to the U.S. government's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, quote, the group has always used a calculated approach, which allows them to sharpen their tactics, techniques, and procedures while evading detection. Over time, their operations have become increasingly complex and destructive. The tools and implants employed by this group are consistently complex and demonstrate a strong focus on effectiveness and operational security, end quote. They've actually been designated by the United States as an advanced persistent threat. These are smart, smart people who are recruited by the North Korean government, trained by the North Korean government, and employed by the North Korean government, just like we go to our own nine to five jobs. So what happened to these hackers? Precisely nothing. International sanctions were increased on North Korea like they, I don't know, could be increased more. No arrests were made of anyone in North Korea, but that individual who had previously worked as a manager at RCBC Bank in the Philippines was charged with and found guilty of money laundering for arranging the payment to the casinos, also known as driving the bills straight there to be wheeled onto the gambling floor. She was sentenced to 56 years in jail and was ordered to pay a staggering fine of $101 million, which is actually more money than the hackers even snagged. Talk about a scapegoat. 
The money vanished into the wind and the pockets of someone we will likely never know. I mean, it was probably the North Korean government. The Beagle Boys remain completely at large, wreaking continued havoc around the world. This heist showed how fragile and vulnerable bank security is as a whole. As a result of the heist, massive security overhauls were made at banks across the world, and also at SWIFT itself. But it was only a matter of time before that security was compromised. In a joint statement released by several U.S. government agencies, the Beagle Boys started robbing banks through remote internet access again in February 2020 to fund the North Korean regime. They were targeting 30 countries, mostly in the global south. Thanks for hanging out with me. I think it is important to say that even though this is a caper without a death, it's not just random dollars and cents. That much money to a developing nation like Bangladesh, it really could mean that people starve. This is not a victimless crime. There's a whole other cybercrime after this one that's a lot more scary and also committed by the Beagle Boys. And even more than this one, it shows the vulnerabilities of our cybersecurity in all parts of our society. I watched a fascinating documentary. It's called Billion Dollar Heist, which made me want to start storing all of my cash under my mattress. <laughs> you can stream it in a lot of places and it's linked in the description box. Next week is a skipped upload, but the week after that, we're looking at a case that isn't so much a cyber crime as a man highly involved in the cyber sphere that committed a lot of crime. Maybe, allegedly, probably. Go give me a follow on Twitter and see some fun, true caper of the day tweets. I'll see you in two weeks. And remember, there are always alternatives to stealing a billion dollars through cyberspace. <laughs>